welcome everyone to the inaugural episode of This Is Halloween Reviews. And to start us off, I thought we would take a look at one of the first names in movie horror. Like, literally one of the first names. You look at the huge pantheon of movie monsters and psychos that have inhabited the silver screen over the centuries, and invariably there is one name that will always come up. It is a name that is legend. It set the bar. And in any vampire genre, there's always this question of, will he show up? It is a name that carries great weight. And it is also a name that has become something of a joke. I speak, of course, of the one, the only, Count Dracula. Um, so Count Dracula is one of those characters that has been portrayed so many times in the movies. He's up there with like Sherlock Holmes and Santa Claus as one of the most portrayed fictional characters. And everybody has their take. But regardless of what your take is, that take inevitably is going to be compared eventually to the first to be compared to the great Bela Lugosi and his genre-redefining performance as the Dark Prince. Every performance of Dracula that has come after this has been some kind of reaction. It has either been trying to duplicate what he did, trying to get away from what he did, or trying to make fun of what he did. And as we've discussed many times in various drive-home review formats, when you decide that the path you want to take is to poke fun at this pop culture icon, someone that everybody knows, even if they've never seen one of his movies or read the book, you're walking a very fine line. Even comedy legend Mel Brooks fucked it up with his Dracula Dead and Loving It, one of the worst parodies of all time, in my opinion. So to do it, you have to have a gentle hand You've got to have proper respect for the source material, and you've got to have a good gimmick. And that is what brings us to today's film, 1979's Love at First Bite. So this was a comedy uh, released, as I said, just at the tail end of the 70s, that decided it wanted to play around with the lore of Dracula, and they wanted one specific lore. Uh, this film is a send-up and, and, in my opinion, a loving homage to the Bela Lugosi uh, stint as Dracula. The only, he only did two films as Dracula, I believe. The first one in Abbott and Costello meet Frank, Frankenstein. I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure he only played Dracula twice. And that's pretty astonishing considering the legacy he left behind. But this film is hands down, flat out, there to be a homage to the Bela Lugosi Dracula. So what's the story? Well, um, our Count Dracula here, played by George Hamilton, is suddenly, and for reasons that are incredibly weird, but then again, it's that kind of movie, uh, is kicked out of his ancestral castle. He and his assistant Renfield, played by Laugh-In's Artie Johnson, um, who I'll talk about again at length here in a second, um, make their way to New York, where Count Dracula hopes to find a model that he's become obsessed with, a magazine model uh, named... Oh, shit, what is, what is the character's name? Uh, who cares? Uh, she's played by Susan St. James. <laughs> Cindy Sondheim, that's the character's name. He, he's become obsessed with uh, this model, Cindy Sondheim, who he believes is the reincarnated soul of a woman he's been in love with for hundreds of years and has always been trying to catch up to, but has always just fallen short. So they travel to New York to find her, and when he does, she is a she's a she's a mess. She's a fucking mess. She's a drug she's a druggie. She's an alcoholic. She's an erotic. She is a. Uh, she's a I don't know I don't know what the right word is she's just a she's just a terrible messed up person and yet he still sees the beauty in her 
and falls in love with her and she with him. And of course things are complicated when it turns out that her psychiatrist boyfriend who she's been seeing off and on for nine years just so happens to be the great great grandson of one Professor Von Helsing. So there's a lot here. So right away, the, the setup for this film is rock solid. So what if Dracula, and not just any Dracula, what if a Bela Lugosi Dracula, which was a Dracula from the 1930s, ended up in what was then modern day New York? And what would that look like? And from that point, just from that premise alone, a lot of great comedy is milk. The anachronism of Dracula with his cape and his, you know, tuxedo walking around, you know, 1979 New York. You can see the comedy kind of coming out of it already. Um, the culture shock of him going from Transylvania where everybody's afraid of him and everybody, you know, um, knows his name to New York where his name is a joke. Um, so yeah, a lot of great, a lot of great uh, setup for comedy, and it pays off. And I don't think this movie would be as good as it is if it wasn't for our main character, and that is George Hamilton as Count Dracula. Now I know George Hamilton has kind of become a suntan joke uh, in the in recent years, but he is a good actor, and I personally believe this is his best performance. First of all, I gotta say, the man fills out a Dracula costume. Fantastic. He looks great. And he's got that look, that steely-eyed glare, you know, that seductive manner about him, that even though he's putting on this really overdone Boris Karloff Romanian accent, there's still that old-world European gentleman charm that Bela Lugosi had oozing out of George Hamilton. But aside from that, um, this movie would not work if we didn't care about Dracula. Dracula is not the antagonist here. He's our hero. He's the person we're falling for. He's the person that we're rooting for. And it takes really skilled writing and a really skilled performer to one, make Dracula a likable character, and two, pay homage to the Bela Lugosi style of Dracula, while at the same time subtly making fun of it. And I think this film does that first off by having nothing but respect for the source material. You can tell they had a great respect and they studied the original. This isn't a ha 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 wasn't that original stupid cuz you know really looking at the the original it it is a bit weird now. It's a little laughable. The acting styles, the armadillos in the castle, you know, it is it is a bit uh goofy. But this film never holds it up to ridicule. It it has fun with the premise, but it respects the character and respects the lineage. A lot of the best lines that he has are direct parodies of lines from the original film that are delivered with such pitch perfect uh, cadence and delivery. Uh, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. There, there's one of the best lines um, is when he goes back to Susan St. James' house for the first time and sees that she's all you know, slob and you know she comes out with a glass of wine and a, and a, and a reefer and she's like, I got us this wine and I got us this really great shit to smoke. And he looks at her and just says, I never drink wine and I do not smoke shit. It's fantastic. But aside from that, he imparts his Dracula with, dare I say it, a soul. In one of the funniest and most underrated comic monologues I've ever heard, Dracula gives this touching speech about how lonely his existence has been. And it's a comedy monologue. They're making jokes. And George Hamilton, again, is walking that razor's edge between parody and sincerity. And that is a, that is a fucking impossible high wire act. And he 
does it and does it so well. In that monologue, you're laughing at what he's saying and the way he's saying it, you know, with that overblown Romanian accent. But you're also sympathizing with the guy. You know, he's saying things like, you know, how would you like to go out dressed like a head waiter, you know, for the last 700 years? Um, he really gives it all. And when he, when he is in love or when he is sad or when he is truly happy, we, the audience, feel it. Um, I think another great bit of applause needs to go out to Artie Johnson um, who played Renfield, one of the most recognizable Renfields ever. And just that laugh that he, you know, <laughs> um, I did, I, I didn't realize and I felt really bad. And that's why I, uh, I wanted to dedicate this video to him is, uh, I did not realize he passed away last year. And, uh, I feel very bad about that because I grew up with his Renfield you know, this is this is who I think of when I think of Renfield, and uh, I didn't realize he passed away, and I, you know, and I didn't include him in uh, Drive Home Reviews Remembers for that year. And unfortunately, it's just the way it happens sometimes. You know, you can't keep up with everything. And um, but yeah, what a what a performance from him! It is a great great role, and he is just he he is literally eating the scenery, and it's fantastic. Um, I just think so much about this film works. The comedy lands more often than not. And the love story and the seductive element of it still work. You know, you really buy it. And they, again, it's that perfect balancing act of melodrama and sincerity. Um, that, that They never forget that they're in a comedy, but they allow the real emotion to come through. There's a great scene where Dracula and Cindy are making love and she bites him. She's biting his neck and he's looking up at the... So he says, after all these years to have someone bite me again. And it's, it's a funny line, but there is a sincerity to it that you're just like, wow, what that must feel like for him. You know, it, it's a... So much of the script is just so crisp and clear. There are a lot of great funny parts in this. Um, but, and this is where we have to have the uncomfortable conversation. Um, I really love this movie. But you cannot deny that as the years go on, um, that so much of it is very, very dated. Um, which is okay. A lot of things from older movies are dated. But you have to remember the era in which it was made, the 70s. And, uh, yeah. This was a time when uh, we're not as enlightened as we should be in this day and age by... The 21st century, you know, 20 years into it, we should be we should be closer to Starfleet than to cavemen, but we are clearly not. But honestly, when you watch parts of this film, you are reminded of how far we have in fact come, and that's good in one way, but it makes you very fucking sad uh, in another. For instance, um, it's view on gender politics. Um, there is a moment, you know. When, uh, again, I think it's that same scene where uh, Susan St. James and George Hamilton are in bed and she's saying, I think I'm falling in love with you. You know, I want to go away with you. He says, well, what about your career? And she says, oh, that. Well, you know, I think women have careers the same way men fool around. It's a lot of fun until you find the right person. And it's just like, oh, oh, that is the sound of all the suffragettes crying at once. Um... So, yeah, that is not good. But I, I will say, I remember uh, when, I was in, uh, when I was in high school, I took a, a history class, and they were talking about, you know, women in history. And uh, they used a clip from this film as an example of, you know, women surrendering, you know, their power to men and all that. Um, and the clip they chosen, or they chose, the clip they chosen, the clip they chose was actually not that one, but one later in the film 
that is the complete opposite of that. So at the very end, spoilers, you know, when she, when they're being chased and, you know, they're getting ready and they're, tr they're cornered and the only way out of it is for him to really go for it and turn her into a vampire. And she says, I don't know, I don't know, Vladimir, you have to make the decision for me. And they use that clip. But if you watch the rest of the movie, her whole character arc is that she doesn't make decisions. She, she, she lets other people dictate her life. And in that moment, and they cut this part out of that clip, he says, no, you have to make the decision. I'm not going to make it for you. You have to choose. And it fulfilled her character arc. Again, maybe that's just me as a white hetero man seeing it the way I want to see it. I don't know. But like I said, uh, the scene that I always found it weird, the scene they chose to make that point was not the scene where she compares her career to a man screwing around before marriage. Um, and if that was the only scene that was problematic, I think we'd be okay. Unfortunately, it is not. This is a movie in the 70s. And uh, let's just say it's, its attitude towards race relations and race politics, not the most enlightened at all. Whoa, boy. Oh, man. There's some stuff in here that you watch and you're just like, holy fucking shit. You know, that's just that. Oh, wow. It's in a, and you know, I'm no prude. You know, I, you know, I'm a, at least not about most things. You know, I'm, I'm a longtime fan of South Park and Family Guy. So I know, you know, distasteful and offensive jokes. Um, but damn some of the shit in this movie. And I wouldn't bring it up except I really wish more people saw this movie because, again, I think it is, I think it has some great funny moments. It has one of the most underrated Draculas of all time. It's got a clever premise. It has a lot of fun with it. It is honest and sincere, but also melodramatic and has a lot of elements of parody. It pays great respect to the source material that it's borrowing from, but at the same time uh, isn't afraid to poke fun at it. There is just a lot of good in this movie, but the problem is how much you enjoy this movie is going to be based in large part into how well you can handle films from other times with other senses of humor. If you're one of the people who takes no joy in sex in you know casual sexism and racism for comedy um you are not gonna like this if you're somebody who can detach themselves a little bit from it and do the it was that time it was that place recognize that it was still awful but still enjoy the other qualities of the movie then you can enjoy it a little bit more but you know i love this movie but i even loving it, I'm I watch rewatching it. I was still going oh. Um, so it's a it's a hard thing when you want more people to recognize a film that you really enjoy, but in doing so, you know that you've got to prepare people for this is going to be offensive. This um, there's there's some fairly offensive jokes about homosexuals in it as to as well. So you know. And again, not in that playful South Park family guy kind of way where it's like, we're, we're just saying this to be offensive. It's like, no, they're coming at these people to offend them. They're, they're, they're literally going at these people. So it's one of those films that, especially in this day and age, we're starting to look at and go, oh, is this okay? And I don't have the answer to that. I know that the chunks of this movie that I like, I really like. And it's one of those films that, again, another thing people should know about me is I'm not a big fan of the concept of remakes or reboots, but this is a film that if they could find the right actors, this would be a good one to remake and do it with some more modern sensibilities because that way the good parts of the film could still be preserved. But then again, you wouldn't have George Hamilton as Dracula. You wouldn't have Artie Johnson as Renfield. So it's one of those films you've really got to watch with a lot of salt. Not a grain of salt. you got to watch with a lot of it. 
So you are warned, but I think the good stuff in this movie is worth the effort. Um, I really do. I think there's some great, great bits in here. And if you're brave enough, maybe if you want to check it out, you will too. Um, so thank you for joining us on this inaugural episode of This Is Halloween Reviews. And we've got a doozy coming up next, folks. We got a real doozy. One of the greatest movie monsters of all time. And he will teach us how to live like the human and to think like the human. So until next time, happy Halloween, drive safe, and I will see you at the movies. Yeah!